Please have a seat. Misused power, exploitation, questionable relationships. Did we just hear from scripture or was this the plot of an episode of Breaking Bad? Seriously, though, the telling of the death of John the Baptist in the Gospel of Mark is gruesome and rife with scandal. And while I was tempted to change the Gospel reading appointed for today to a more palatable passage, I decided to stick with it because it is such a difficult text. So let's dive in. From a timeline perspective, Jesus has been at work teaching and preaching and healing throughout the region of Galilee. And this has raised a lot of questions about who Jesus is. As we just heard, some are saying that Jesus is Elijah. Others say that he is like a prophet of old. And still others thought he was John the baptizer raised from the dead. When Herod, the one responsible for the death of John the Baptist, gets wind of this, he is convinced that Jesus is definitely John the Baptist resurrected. So Mark uses this as an opportunity to give us the backstory. But there are a few things that we should know about Herod to help give us a little bit more context. First, this is not King Herod the Great, the one who tried to get the wise men to lead him to baby Jesus in the nativity story. This is not that Herod. This is his son, Herod Antipas, who upon the death of his father was given the region of Galilee to rule over. And Herod Antipas wasn't actually a king in the way that we might think. He was tetriarch, which is more like a governor, and he ruled as a client state of the Roman Empire. He was technically Jewish, but in practice, not so much. The Jewish faithful over whom he governed questioned his piety and and had little respect for him. Truth be told, any authority claimed by Herod was allowed simply because it suited the Romans to have him where he was. So he was basically a puppet of the Roman Empire. So what's his beef with John? Well, it has to do with this scandalous marriage that he's in. So Herod, we're told, married his brother's wife, Herodias, who he was infatuated with. But it's even more than that. Herodias was also his niece, his other half-brother's daughter. And according to Jewish law, all of this was a big no-go, and John had no problem reminding Herod of this. Now, to Herod, John is poking holes in his legitimacy. He was threatening his power, and Herod... Herod is keen to hold on to any ounce of power that he has. So he does what he can. He has John arrested. Now, given everything that we know thus far, you would think that Herod would have ordered John's execution right away, silencing this threat once and for all. But that's not what he does. Maybe he thought that John's death would create an even bigger rift between him and his Jewish constituents. Or maybe he felt like this was the only way to hold on to a shred of his faith. We're told he did like to listen to John and recognized him as a righteous and a holy man. One can even imagine here a sense of Herod wrestling with himself, going as far as to protect John when others wanted him dead. But all of that goes out the window during a party where things go too far. At his birthday banquet, 
thrilled by the popularity of his daughter among his courtiers and officers. Herod makes a drunken promise to reward his daughter with whatever she asks for. And his wife, seeing an opportunity to silence the threat, prompts her daughter to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. You know how there is that moment in every story where the antagonist has the chance to make a different choice? Where there's the opportunity to let go of ego and embrace redemption? The opportunity to accept or reject grace? Well, this is that moment in this story. And Herod chooses ego. He chooses to give his daughter what she's asked for, to be seen as a ruler who fulfills his oath, to be seen as a ruler who is strong. And so John the Baptist is killed, head served up on a platter. Now it appears that on some level, Herod knows that what he's done is terrible. In a shallow attempt to make things better, he allows John's followers to take his body for a proper burial, perhaps only to save face. But there is a sense that it's something more. Perhaps it's all those things that John told him. All those things that Herod didn't understand but liked to listen to. Herod knows deep down that there's something to it all. And remember, John preached of God's overarching grace. He preached of repentance for the forgiveness of sin, and he preached of the one who would come after him, who would embody this grace and this forgiveness in ways that is really hard to grasp. In essence, John's entire ministry was to point to Jesus, which is why when Herod learns of everything that Jesus is up to, he is convinced that Jesus is John raised from the dead. The thing is, Herod still doesn't get it. He might be shaking in his sandals, but at the end of the day, being seen as someone with authority and power is more important to him than leading with compassion. Fast forward, and Herod does end up meeting Jesus. Luke tells us in his gospel account that when Jesus is arrested... Pilate sends him to Herod. But when Jesus doesn't perform for Herod the way that Herod wants him to, he ends up wanting the same fate for Jesus as was for John and sends him back to Pilate to meet his fate. For Herod, playing into the hands of those perceived as the most powerful, and taking what he wants when he wants is more enticing than repentance, even when God's grace is standing right there in front of him. Which is tragically where we see the good news of the gospel at work in this story. Unlike a tyrant, God's rule is not forced upon anyone. Jesus' reign is not about power at any cost. No, the way of Jesus is an invitation into the grace and the mercy and the love of God, which is freely given and freely received. And the way of Jesus is is one that finds power in weakness, justice in compassion, even when the world around us shows us something very different. 
When we look around, it's not hard to see the Herods of our time. Those for whom holding on to the perception of power at all costs has overshadowed all else. It's not hard to see that self-centeredness and ego end up inflicting pain over and over and over again. Tragedy and hurt and horror happen way too often. And we can feel paralyzed with fear and frustration when confronted with it all. Yet as people of faith, we're called to remember that in the middle of it all, in spite of it all, God continues to be at work. The invitation into the way of Jesus continues to be extended over and over and over again. For God's love is more patient, more far-reaching, more forgiving than we can ever comprehend. When we find ourselves overwhelmed by tragedy or even tempted to misuse any authority or power we may ourselves have, I think that one of the most radical things we can do is say yes to God. To say yes to God's grace, to say yes to God's love, and then do our part in extending the invitation into God's grace with others. To have the courage to point to another way, a way that may at times even seem impossible. But this is a way that never gives up on us or pits us one against another. It's a way that invites us to live lives anchored in hope, not fear. And it's a way that is open to anyone, if only we would receive. Amen.